by conviction, and devoted to one another and the country we love with all our hearts. May God bless America, and may God protect our troops. Thank you, America. Oh, that was just extraordinary, Fred. Oh, yeah. goodness. Yeah, so Capricia, why don't I turn to you? Uh, you were there for the uh, uh, inauguration, President Obama, President Clinton. How does this compare? How, give, us, give us a little bit of perspective on what you've just heard. Well, all of these moments when you're sitting on that dais and you are watching a president take the oath of office and then speak to the world, speak to the country, speak to the people of the United States, and, and, and like I said, all over the world about what their goals are, what their mission is, and, and how they, they have um, so many hopes in, in particularly on this day of uniting our country. Um, and being again that democratic example. I mean, they, they, they all are extraordinary days, um, but I do have to say that because of the state that our country is in right now, the pandemic, the, um, the issues that happened several weeks ago, you know, right there on the Capitol steps, um, it makes this day just, I don't know, yeah. so much more poignant. Well, it makes it amazing grace, and that's what Garth Brooks is about to sing for us right now. So let's listen to Garth Brooks. Wonderful. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. When we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first I can ask you to sing this last verse with me. Not just the people here, but the people at home. At work as one, united. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see well are we Capricia, oh. that was that was absolutely amazing, uh, a, a fitting end. So this was really the America United inaugural speech. Uh, the quotes, there's so many quotes that people will point to, but the we must end this unsettled war between red and blue, between urban and suburban, liberal and conservative. There have been unifying messages in inaugurations before Capricia, but not 14 days after an insurrection in the Capitol. And I actually think that event gives uh, uh, President Biden, not President-elect Biden, President Biden, a better chance to unify than if it had not happened. I don't know how you feel about that. I, I agree with that, Fred. And I mean, you are the guru of history. Um, there is no one who can compare to you. Um, but it is, um, you, you are absolutely right. The sentiment that 
uh, President Biden expressed in those words, um, I felt the healing take place here in our country. I felt the melding together now um, of difference into one united front. Um, and, and we shall see, we shall see in the days ahead, lots of, lots of work to do. Um, and they're getting right to business right away. Immediately after this ceremony, they're heading almost directly uh, to the Oval Office uh, to begin to execute um, the nation's business. And here's the, na here's the first ever National Youth Poet Laureate. So, poet laureate. so I, I think for this uh, voice from the future, we probably uh, will want to listen to her voice as well. Um, here we go. Mr. President, Dr. Biden, Madam Vice President, Mr. Emhoff, Americans and the world. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace, and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always just is. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting for one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to forge our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first. We must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped, that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together, victorious, not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise to Glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare it. Because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared it at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour, but within it we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope and laughter to ourselves. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce, and free.
We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens. But one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left with every breath from my bronze pounded chest. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the gold limbed hills of the West. We will rise from the wind swept Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rimmed cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known of our nation in every corner called our country, our people diverse and beautiful will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. Oh, well, you know, Fred, she reminds me of a, a, a young Maya Angelou and, and her poem, Still I Rise. The moment she started speaking, I, I, I thought of her so fondly, a great poet. Uh, so that, that's great for our international audience. Uh, um, give us a feeling of what this uh, recalls in previous inaugurations. There's always some moment like this, and, and, and the Obama inauguration, Clinton inauguration, what does it recall for you? You know, um, these, these moments, these speakers have been selected so specifically by the president. This is his celebration, his day. And he wanted a relationship tied to each and every person. I believe that this is now the benediction. Yes, let's listen to this. It's the Reverend Sylvester Beeman from the Bethel AME Church, Wilmington, Delaware. So this is Joe Biden's church and Joe right. Biden's uh, reverend. As a nation and people of faith gathered in this historical moment, let us unite in prayer. God, we gather under the beauty of your holiness and the holiness of your beauty. We seek your face, your smile, your warm embrace. We petition you once more in this celebration. We pray for divine favor upon our president, Joseph R. Biden, and our first lady, Dr. Jill Biden, and their family. We further ask that you would extend the same favor upon our vice president, Kamala D. Harris, and our second gentleman, Doug Imhoff, and their family. More than ever, more than ever, they and our nation need you. We need you, for in you we discover our common humanity. In our common humanity, we will seek out the wounded and bind their wounds. We will seek healing for those who are sick and diseased. We will mourn our dead. We will befriend the lonely, the least, and the left out. We will share our abundance with those who are hungry. We will do justly to the oppressed, acknowledge sin, and seek forgiveness, thus grasping reconciliation. In discovering our humanity, we will seek the good in and for all our neighbors. We will love the unlovable, remove the stigma of the so-called untouchables, we will care for our most vulnerable, our children, the elderly, emotionally challenged, and the poor. We will seek rehabilitation beyond correction. We will extend opportunity to those locked out of opportunity. We will make friends of our enemies. We will make friends of our enemies. People, your people, shall no longer raise up weapons against one another. 
We will rather use our resources for the national good and become a beacon of life and goodwill to the world. And neither shall we learn hatred anymore. We will lie down in peace and not make our neighbors afraid. In you, O oh God, we discover our humanity. In our humanity, we discover our commonness. Beyond the difference of color, creed, origin, political party, ideology, geography, and personal preferences. We'll become greater stewards of your environment, preserving the land, reaping from it a sustainable harvest, and securing its wonder and miracle-giving power for generations to come. This is our benediction, that from these hallowed grounds where slaves labor to build this shrine and citadel to liberty and democracy. Let us all acknowledge from the indigenous Native American to those who recently received their citizenship, from the African American to those whose foreparents came from Europe and every corner of the globe, from the wealthy to those struggling to make it, from every human being, regardless of their choices, that this is our country. As such, teach us, O oh God. As such, teach us, O oh God, to live in it, love in it, be healed in it, and reconcile to one another in it, lest we miss kingdom's goal. To your glory, majesty, Dominion and power forever. Hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. In the strong name of our collective faith. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing. So that was. As color guard retires our national colors. Once again, so powerful. Make friends of our enemies. Um, uh, you know, let me just reflect on what's not been said in the inaugural or not said as much and then i'm going to turn to capricia for her reflections of how this might have run differently with the president of the united states outgoing there with the outgoing first lady um, but uh first of all he didn't mention donald trump in his speech uh he didn't mention china he didn't mention russia in fact very little was international it's a real focus as the administration itself on building back better the United States to put the United States in a stronger position to be a model for the for the foreign policy that it would lead otherwise. The two quotes, the memorable lines from the section on allies on international, are America has been tested and we are stronger for it. Uh, President Biden is saying we are stronger now and we're coming back. He's also saying, uh, and he's used this on the campaign trail, he used this on an acceptance speech, will lead not merely by the example of our power, but the power of our example. He believes this really deeply. Um, he, it wasn't a speech with a lot of flourishes. He doesn't like rhetorical flourishes. This isn't John F. Kennedy. He wants to speak to people and speak to people in a language they understand. And in our bifurcated world where you have, uh, you know, websites and talk radio and cable television that's left and right, this is the one time where people can see him uh, without mediation. They can see the real Joe Biden. So hey, those are my initial thoughts. But Capricia, how would this have been, been different if the President of the United States had actually been there, if Melania had been there? Well, first, let me just reflect on what you said here, Fred, a bit, um, that Joe Biden apparently told um, his policymakers and speech writers that if uh, you write something or you say something that your mother doesn't understand, change it. I, I just love that because I think it's so true. He's trying to really reach out and beyond and connect with every American. And I think he did that brilliantly in his words today. Um, you know, I, I am reflective of many of the inaugurations I've had the privilege of attending in the past and uh, from President Clinton's to President Obama's and uh, each of them um, just had days full of activities that were planned by the presidential inaugural committee. Uh, you know, one of the first meetings that takes place 
is uh, between the outgoing first lady and the incoming. Uh, I recall fondly Barbara Bush standing at the South Portico with arms open wide uh, when Hillary Clinton walked up the South grounds after a very, very contentious election, if you remember. And she embraced her and then scooped her up and brought her into the house so that they could sit down, have a coffee, have a tour of the house, introduce her to the residence staff, show her the personal family quarters. And then eight years later, Hillary Clinton did the exact same thing for Laura Bush after a very difficult campaign, after a very contentious election. And, you know, brought her into the house, welcomed her. You know, they, they exchanged notes, um, have discussions. It's about building these bridges from one administration to the next, these seamless transitions. That's one of the first meetings. And then, of course, there is a, a meeting of the former presidents that takes place in the Oval Office. Um, and then on Inauguration Day, what didn't occur today was really sort of, I just, it hurt my heart a little bit to watch the meeting of, or the welcoming of the sitting first, sitting president uh, to the uh, president-elect at the White House itself. It's a, it's a very small amount of time. It's a short coffee, but I was there at the end of the Clinton administration. I was one of three staff people who were given the honor of being there on that day. I had to plan all the logistics, move the people in and out, assist the president and first lady, and, uh, and they welcomed President-elect Bush and, and Mrs. Bush, Vice President-elect Cheney and Mrs. Cheney to the White House. They had some time in the blue room, chatted amongst themselves, and then I received the notice that it was time for them to move by the presidential inaugural committee. Now, remember, this was a very tough election. Al Gore and uh, between Al Gore and Pres and then Governor Bush. Um, so tensions were high. It was you know, a little tough, a really tough day for them in particular. Uh, but I remember after everyone else was loaded into the motorcade that um, as President Clinton and President Elect Bush were putting their overcoats on, President Clinton reached across, he took President Elect Bush's shoulders, he them, and then he gave him a pat on the back and he looked at him and said, come on, let's go do this. And President Elect Bush looked back at him without saying a word. You could tell he was saying, don't worry, I've got this. And within that moment, there was this transition of power between these two men who have completely different philosophies about how our country should be run. It was just magical for me and I'll remember it forever. And then they took off, got in the same car, made their way to Capitol Hill for the inauguration. Um, just now, as the as the President uh, Biden and Vice President Harris are leaving the Capitol, they'll make their way to the other side of the Capitol and uh, they will review the troops. This is something that traditionally they do with the outgoing president. Uh, but now um, President Trump has gone. He decided to leave early and not attend these events. Um, and so in a show of unity, after the review of the troops, President Biden, uh, uh, Vice President Harris, along with former presidents Bush, Obama, and uh, Clinton will make their way to Arlington Cemetery and along with the former first ladies uh, will lay a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. And this again will be so symbolic to our nation and to our world about the unity that we share and about the fact that this is not about Republican or Democrat, this is about America. And thank you so much for Capricia. That is so rich for everyone listening in. And I know we have uh, people listening in from all over the world. Uh, you can send in your questions via the app uh, for the Atlantic Council Global Energy Forum. Um, if, if you don't have access to that, but you have a Twitter feed, you can actually send questions also to my Twitter feed to uh, at Fred Kemp and we'll monitor that and we'll watch for questions that. And also commentary. One of the questions I have is, was, it, was the swearing in not 10 minutes early? Uh, because it was 1150 and I know the nuclear codes get transferred at noon. Um, and I didn't really know what to say to all of you. And we're looking into that, but a lot of you are experts who are watching us. So maybe you can actually give us the answer to that. Um, I do want to re read a quote uh, from Ronald Reagan in his first inaugural address, which was January 20th, uh, 1981. And this was, 
the beginning of his inaugural address. And Capricia, it speaks to what you're talking about, this, this miracle of the transfer of power. And it says, to a few of us here today, this is a solemn and most momentous occasion. And yet in the history of our nation, it is a commonplace occurrence. The orderly transfer of authority as called for in the constitution routinely takes place as it has for almost two centuries and few of us stop to think how unique we really are. Hmm. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four year ceremony we accept as normal and nothing less than a miracle. And then he turns on the stage to President Carter and thanks him personally for the transition. That's what we missed today. What we did have was Vice President Pence. And this is quite an amazing story. He was not at the airport at St. An uh, uh, sorry, at Andrews Air Force Base, joined Air, uh, Air Force Base this morning, seeing off the president. But he was uh, continuing this transitional uh, uh, tradition in his own way uh, as Vice President, sitting uh, on uh, right by everything that happened today for throughout that. Yes, um, those are powerful words, Fred, uh, from uh, former President Ronald Reagan, um, how we sometimes miss the simplicity of these moments because we almost take them for granted, don't we? I, I don't think that we will ever, ever do that again. Um, since the, the insurrection that took place several weeks ago, I, I believe that everyone now cherishes and holds most dear um, our fragile democracy that... Uh, President Biden referred to today. Now here they are uh, descending those steps. So um, we have a question for the audience. I think this is much better for you because I actually don't know the answer to this, which is where is President, what, where is President Biden, uh, what is President Biden doing right now and where is he going? And, and this of course is much different. We've got COVID-19. Uh, you had like a million people come to town. It was probably the most ever uh, for Obama's inauguration. And this of course is going to be the least ever because the pandemic won't allow it. But uh, what, what, how will the rest of the day run for President Biden and for um, uh, the first lady? Right, and you and you you are you are spot on as always, Fred. Um, I recall making my way through the streets of President Obama's uh, inauguration, and boy, they were jam packed. I couldn't even get a car down. We had to take a uh, one of those bike taxis to get anywhere close to uh, to the parade route. Um, just really spectacular. Um, when I went up for the first inauguration, the second inauguration, I was. Uh, quite privileged to be there on the dais with the uh, the Foreign Diplomatic Corps representing each and every country around the world. Um, so now they are, you know, we, we got a, a bit of a glimpse of the military line lining the steps uh, in a cordon, a military cordon, uh, awaiting the arrival of President Biden and, uh, and Vice President Harris, um, where there will be a review of the troops. Um, this is uh, traditional and again, quite symbolic. He is now commander in chief of our military. Um, as you note, uh, Fred, that the, um, the football has been passed. That's what they call the nuclear codes is held within the, uh, within the uh, football and by the president's own military aid. Um, the one person who was with uh, President Trump, the military aid has now, um, as, uh, oh, see, this is the traditional. They are showing footage of a traditional departure. That is uh, President Obama and Mrs. Obama escorting then uh, President Bush and Mrs. Bush to Marine One for them to take off and uh, go on their last flight of Marine One uh, and then on their last flight home on Air Force One. Um, but that is not taking place today because President Trump decided to uh, leave early um, at the crack of dawn, um, from what I understand, or actually what I saw. And, 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 uh, and for our listeners, this is a live Reuters feed. So really, we really don't know in advance what we're going to be seeing. So you're going to be seeing it with us as it, as it, as it rolls by us. These are great inaugurations from time past. Uh, just wonderful to, to see the history and the traditions that had started um, at the early days of our country and have continued to unfold. Um, but you know, after they have the review of the troops, um, they will make their way to Arlington Cemetery and to lay a wreath at the tomb of the unknown soldier. This is, this is a traditional um, event that takes place 
but this time it will occur with uh, former presidents, uh, Obama, Bush, and Clinton in attendance and the first ladies as and, well. And, and this picture, this, 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 this video will be uh, familiar to you, Capricia. That's right. Uh, there is President Obama uh, descending the steps after his eight year term in office uh, with the newly um, uh, inaugurated um, President Donald Trump. And they are escorting to go to Marine One for their last, uh, for their last ride. And, so uh, there, are three, there, there are three presidents who have skipped the inauguration after polarized elections. So it was John Adams in 1801, uh, and, uh, and that was a hard fought uh, election, a lot of personal attacks, deadlocked. It was Thomas Jefferson who became uh, then the president. Uh, you know, one was, uh, you know, by 19, 1811, Jefferson and Adams rekindled their friendship and they started to correspond with each other again. The second was John Quincy Adams, 1829, with the inauguration of Andrew Jackson. He was the sixth American president, uh, and he followed in his father's footsteps where, when he declined to attend the swearing in of the man who had unseated him. Uh, uh, and then uh, the one that we're talking about the most, because it's the most recent where this happened, was Andrew Johnson in 1869, uh, four years after the Civil War, with the inauguration of Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, and that was a, a, a close run thing. He almost did come to the inauguration. But it culminated in Johnson's, and by the way, he was impeached. He wasn't on the ballot. The Democratic Party had nominated Horatio Seymour, and there was great animosity be between Jan Johnson and Grant. Uh, Grant led the Union to victory in the Civil War, and Johnson uh, was a Southerner who oppo opposed Reconstruction. But it, it ended with Johnson's refusal to attend the inauguration and it was so last minute that the carriage that arrived to carry him on the morning of the ceremony was turned away. So the carriage actually showed up to take him. So I, I, I think it was good that, that President Biden reminded us that divisions are not new to America they are uh, and that we've overcome them before. And he said that in his speech and I thought it was a good thing that he did that. And you know, here we are um, witnessing the, um, the exchange between former Vice President Pence and now Vice President Kamala Harris. I think this is really an important moment. Um, we are seeing the seamless transition of power between these two leaders. And I do, as you had said, uh, Fred, give a tip of the hat to uh, former Vice President Pence in that he showed up on this very important day. He understood uh, the responsibility of, of the position that he held and the duty to country that he needed to serve. Um, you also noted this, that how some relationships uh, shift over time between presidents. I, uh, I watched how uh, George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton's relationship really moved to almost a-, a Capricia, I don't mean to interrupt you, but sure. you, you pointed this out and you see this. This is what we would be seeing right now with um, President Trump getting in the helicopter with Melania. But this is the moment. This is really the moment of separation now. That's right. That you would normally see. So that's Vice President Pence, as you said, Capricia, playing the role that he 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 should constitutionally and also ethically, morally be playing. And it's a good thing that he's doing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, he does not get the ride on Marine One. <laughs> <laughs> that, that occurred on the South Grounds at about eight o'clock this morning yeah. um, and, uh, and took off on Air Force One, which I understand should be probably making its way back to Andrews Air Force Base now. But anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt you, so please continue. Oh, sure. So I just wanted to note that, you know, elections are contentious. They're tough. People go through a lot. They're, they're very hard fought. Um, but it is interesting once these people take these positions, these top leadership positions, not only in our country, but the world, um, they have an understanding of the importance of, the, of that role and, um, and their relationships change over time. Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford became the best of friends. Um, Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush, uh, he almost adopted him into the family. Uh, Mrs. Bush, Barbara Bush, referred to Bill Clinton as her other son. And, um, and he has a great relationship now with George Bush. 
so there's there are these relationships um they they change because they have one common you know as you noted this is the 46th person to take the position of president in our country and they all share in that job. They all share the, the burdens, the duties, the, the historic um, weight of the office. And, um, and so, uh, you know, those relationships do change over time. Thank you, Capricia. Um, and um, uh, I think uh, people uh, who are listening to us, please either ask questions through the app or through uh, at Fred Kemp on, on Twitter feed. Um, one of the things we're watching and one of the questions that's come in is there were 148 um, Republicans who voted against the cert electoral certification. Um, and the question is how many of them were at the inaugural ceremony? We'll look for an answer. We'll search for an answer for that. What I do know is that at least seven of the eight GOP senators, meaning the Republican senators who voted against President-elect Joe Biden's electoral college victory, including Ted Cruz, who was one of the leaders of that group, attended on Wednesday uh, uh, to support the peaceful transition of power. So even though they voted against the certification, they did show up for the peaceful transition of power, which is quite interesting uh, since they were essentially saying, uh, they weren't necessarily saying, we think the election is fraudulent, and many of them would explain, we just wanted to, to say that we wanted something else to be done, sound. But this is going to be really interesting to see how this healing happens, mm -hmm. because um, you know, we now could well have a trial in the Senate on impeachment. Uh, and, uh, and President Biden is a person who likes to reach across the aisle. And uh, for all the talk of unity, the question is, will it be possible? And I think he's picked issues on which to start this stimulus, the $1.9 million package, uh, the, uh, the vaccination effort, uh, uh, 100 million doses uh, or, or 100 days, of, I, I, I have to double check those numbers, but he's trying to pick issues in the beginning that are going to be unifying. But you've been in administrations, you, you've seen how hard it is to unify. Does one just have to live with a certain amount of division and fighting? Is that just what we're always going to be about? No, I don't believe it is, uh, Fred. I do believe that we can become a, a unified uh, country um, of at least purpose that benefits all Americans. I think that his mandate that every American uh, wear a mask um, during this pandemic is a unifying moment. Um, it should never have, have been divided by a uh, political line of whether or not you wear a mask. This is about saving everyone's life. Um, and so I, I, I do, and Joe Biden just, oh, he has the heart and soul of a, of a person that you, you just gotta love. And I, I do believe that those who did not vote for him will see that. They will see that this is a man from Scranton. This is a man who came from a middle-class family. This is a person who had to work hard to get to where he belonged. This is also a person who suffered dear, great loss. He lost his first wife and children in a car accident. And then his son, Bo, that he refers to fondly over the past few weeks um, in so many of his remarks, um, you know, he, he knows that loss. He knows what people are going through now, the suffering that they are going through, whether it is the loss of a loved one because of the pandemic or because of, of our economy. Um, and so he, he is someone who understands healing. He knows how to heal. He knows how to bring people together and to lay hands on one another. Oh, I, I just think he's the perfect person at this time in our history uh, to bring us all together again. It's so interesting you, you say that former uh, chairman of the Atlantic Council, uh, Chuck Hagel, former secretary of defense, former senator, is very close to Joe Biden. Chuck Hagel was a, served in the Obama administration, but he was he is a Republican, uh, Biden, a Democrat, very, very close. And he says exactly what you're saying, that this is the right person for this time. Mm -hmm. his, his, his instinct is to do deals across the aisle. Uh, he's done it his whole life. Um, this is the way he's led. Uh, but obviously, you, you also know uh, Dr. Biden, you know Jill Biden very well. 
Tell us about her because I, you really get a, you, it's so often that way, Michelle Obama, Barack Obama, but in this case, they really are a partnership in leadership, right? Oh, they really are. And she just, she shines. She's the bright light in, in, in this, in this grouping. Um, you know, she, he depends upon her a great deal, uh, leans on her in these moments. I mean, she is steadfast. She is the core of the family. From the moments that she became a part of uh, the Biden family, when the children were very, very young, she knew that she had to lift them up. Um, she had to uh, keep this family together. And she did just that. And then she was there the entire time through his political career, uh, pushing him forward. Sometimes he was a bit hesitant, I understand, not quite sure if he should be going forward. And she constantly was there as his, his cheerleader. Um, she is remarkable in that uh, she, she has taken on uh, military families as an issue. I understand that she's going to really step in hard uh, with women, not only women's issues, Issues here in the United States, but around the world, and um, and that she is is looking at the issues of how do we reconnect those families um, who are at our border? How do we bring those children back together again um, with their parents? So she's going to lean in hard on a few of these uh, key issues. She's going to continue to work. She will be, I think, the first first lady who will continue to uh, do her day job um, and figure it out in these uh, early days of the pandemic as well. Um, that will be uh, quite an achievement. But um, I was pleased to see her wearing, um, I have to just give you a, a, a fashion note here, Fred. Uh, yesterday, she was wearing the color purple. And today, Kamala Harris and Secretary Clinton were wearing the color purple. And it's very important because that's a color that was uh, very significant to suffragists in the past. And um, it's also considered to be, of course, the combination, the unifying color of red and blue. Um, so big symbols that were going on in the women's fashion wear today. Oh, Capricia, thank you so much. Thank, thank you for that insight. Um, and uh, I am going to do a plug here. Uh, everyone buy this book. It's a terrific book. It's Protocol by Capricia Marshall. Uh, and uh, it's a page turner and it's just uh, fantastic. Um, you, and it just, uh, you know, protocol and the power of diplomacy and how to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and Capricia knows how all of these things work as chief of protocol in the Obama administration, uh, social secretary in the White House, uh, in the Clinton administration, and overseeing the diplomatic details of state visits and summits, G20, nuclear security summit, which by the way, they're going to pattern the democracy summit after they're actually learning from that new nuclear security summit, NATO, Sunnylands, et cetera. So we're really delighted to have Capricia as our, um, as our ambassador in residence. We actually do now have a couple of questions. Uh, one that's come in on China um, uh, and uh, just how different the policies will be and I think it was very interesting in uh, uh, future Secretary of State uh, Tony Blinken's uh, confirmation hearing yesterday that it was more the tone than it was the policy. Um, and I think they'll look for ways to engage China, but they also understand that China is waiting to see if the US has its act together uh, and is going to take us fully seriously. And they know they're being watched for that. But the interesting thing was that Secretary Pompeo on his way out from the Secretary of State uh, uh, charged that the, uh, the, uh, the Chinese with uh, genocide in the treatment of the Uyghurs. And Tony Blinken actually said, uh, Secretary of State Blinken actually said he agreed with that. So I think you'll see changes in tone immediately, but changes in approach to China might have more to do with uh, how China actually responds to Biden uh, and whether China itself uh, uh, can, continues on some of the paths it's on. Um, let me uh, pass a question or two to you, Capricia. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so when, do, when does the real work start, uh, number one? And then number two, um, what does the president do tonight if he doesn't have to make appearances at a dozen inauguration balls? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you know, I, I wanted to, to just remark a bit on what you just said also, um, Fred. You better than anyone knows the importance of uh, administration selection. You have met previous secretaries of state. You have had uh, discussions with those folks who are part of the presidential cabinet. Um, those people are in these top, top positions. I think that the selection of uh, President Biden um, for a Secretary of State, uh, Tony Blinken will be an extraordinary person in this capacity. Um, along with, when you mentioned China, I think of uh, my dear friend, Kurt Campbell, who is now taking on a most interesting point uh, position uh, that uh, in this administration as it um, will be managing uh, the relationships in Asia. Um, so there's, a, there's some great people that, that the president has selected who have considerable experience um, and going into serve in our government um, will be uh, profoundly effective on day one. And when you ask when they are going to start working, uh, they've been they've they've started. Uh, I know my good friend Kathy Russell, who's the head of presidential uh, personnel, has been burning the candle at both ends, uh, trying to fill these slots. They've historically, in a short period of time, because you have to remember the transition got shortened because of all the various issues that occurred uh, that Donald Trump was uh, bringing up lawsuits and, uh, and, and fighting against certain uh, election results. So um, they did not get their funding from GSA for some, some time. Uh, it was hard to get those wheels going, but now they have. And uh, they're filling those slots at rapid speed. Um, and so be, they begin uh, their work today. Today, people are reporting to DOD. To um, Today, they're reporting to all of the agencies, the State Department. I remember um, people going right into the State Department right after the inaugural ceremony, the first inauguration of, of President Obama. Um, I went straight to the White House after the inauguration and began uh, figuring out where my office was. Uh, do I have furniture? Do I have a pen? Do I have paper? Uh, things of that sort. Does the telephone work? Um, and, and really getting uh, to, be, to, to work immediately. Um, and as far as the inaugural balls, well, I'm so sad that they're missing those because boy oh boy are they fun i had such a great time in in both uh in well then four inaugurations that i attended going to those balls um and there are a variety of them and and, and the first year with the clintons um i remember she was wearing the stunning michelle phillips an arkansas designer gown and um and president clinton was just wowed by her and we all went off and um, it was an exhausting evening, one that I handed off to my friend Kelly Craighead, thank goodness, who took over for the rest of the evening, but they attended a, a whopping 14 balls, danced at 14 balls. It was quite extraordinary. But tonight, the um, Obamas, I mean, excuse me, the Bidens rather, will return to the White House um, after the various day, daytime activities and with close, close family, um, they will watch a, a wonderful televised presentation of a, an American celebration. And I have to say, I kind of love this um, because more people are going to be able to participate in this, not in the United, not only in the United States, but around the world. Uh, it will be hosted by Tom Hanks, and we will see entertainers from all walks of life and background, the best of America, showcasing the absolute best of the best that we have to offer um, to celebrate uh, this day of President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris's inauguration. Capricia, thank you so much for that answer. We're getting a, a lot of good questions in here and uh, I'll take a stab at one of them. Uh, and you may know something about this as well. But someone asked about uh, inaugural parades. And of course, we didn't have much of one or any of one this time. Uh, but you know, as, as you noted, the digital world is giving a different approach this year, Capricia. And we found that some of this can work really well. But it says, uh, uh, have we done inaugural parades from the beginning or did it look different in the beginning? I actually looked into this because I, I was asked this by someone else a couple of days ago. So here's the short answer. Um, president Washington, the very first president of the United States, upon learning that his election was official, traveled leisurely over seven days, over seven days from his home in Mount Vernon to the temporary capital of the United States, which was New York City. 
Mm. And he rode in horseback through Alexandria, Georgetown, Washington, Philadelphia, Baltimore. And there were enthusiastic crowds that cheered him all the way, uh, treating him like royalty, crowning him with laurel wreaths, hosting banquets in his honor and saluting him with cannon fire. So that was sort of the first parade and it was uh, spontaneous. Um, and then the first president who actually moved to Washington was, um, was Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and, uh, and he wanted something more subdued. So he just walked with a few friends from his hotel to the Capitol. And then he walked back to his hotel and ate dinner afterwards without any of the hoopla that you're, you were talking about. Uh, and, uh, and then the second time he got elected, he added uh, uh, more horses and more, more um, uh, several hundred well-wisher wishers, including mechanics from the nearby Navy, Navy Yard. And then finally, today's inaugural parade tradition really began with James Madison in 1809. And the official parade included a cavalry unit from Georgetown organized to escort Madison uh, to, the, uh, 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 to the White House. So it was pretty spontaneous before then, and then it, uh, everyone puts their own stamp on it. But uh, someone wants to drill down a little bit more on the answer you just gave on when the real work starts, uh, Capricia. And they say, well, yeah, okay, I get that. But when does it really start? So can you tell us what the president's first hours in the White House are like? Does he dive right into the substantive meetings? Or, or are the first hours used to unpack some bags and adjust to the new surroundings? And I guess part of that question is when we, we know that uh, President Trump and the first lady, former first lady have moved out. When do the Bidens move in? Ah, so um, that 12 o'clock hour that you referenced just a bit ago, Fred, is really important. It uh, sets many things in motion, as, as you noted, uh, the passing of the football, the nuclear codes, but also the moving vans. Um, the moving vans traditionally of the outgoing president uh, were preloaded that this, this morning and uh, with all of their items, their, their suitcases and boxes and everything. And at 12 o'clock, that moving van moves out and the moving van of the incoming president makes its way up the South grounds. Now there is an amazing staff in the White House. These are career folks, people who have, have worked there for years and years and years. Um, they are the, the usher's office um, and as well the, the butlers and the maids. Um, I know my good friend, uh, Buddy Carter, who's been a butler for golly gee, I don't even know, maybe eight presidents, even though he looks like he's only 20, is still there. They know how to do this. They know how to get those items out. Um, the curator's office, uh, Bill Ullman is the, the chief cur curator, and they, they work alongside um, knowing how to take those items out. But also, they're bringing items in from a warehouse, a warehouse that stores uh, a variety of items um, of former presidents, um, former uh, antiquities of the White House, um, that the incoming president and first lady have selected to be on display in the White House. Additionally, at, as well at that 12 o'clock hour, they are dismantling the former president's oval office. They're taking down the draperies, they're pulling up the carpet, they're hauling out the old furniture, and they are replacing it with temporary furnishings that the incoming president has selected so that he has a whole new look for when he comes in. It's again, symbolic, important symbolism of this transfer of power from one administration uh, to the next. And and so when President Biden returns to the White House, he's lucky he, he lives uh, just above the shop and he will go into his Oval Office and begin to uh, get right to work. His staff, I dare say, I will bet that Ron Klain, the chief of staff is already at his desk and starting to um, make agendas and schedules for uh, the president and, um, and get ready uh, for the work at hand. So yeah, it really does begin today. Uh, they will go back to the White House and, and begin that. And then in the evening, they will relax as a family. They will share some moments um, together and, and watch the, um, the various inaugural activities on television um, as a family. 
Capricia, for all of you tuning in, by the way, how lucky are we? Uh, you are getting the kind of insider knowledge and insider analysis that you're not going to find on any other channel <laughs> in the world right now on this. So Capricia, that's absolutely, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, and it's quite different too, isn't it? Um, you know, with President Biden, this is a person who's spent time in the White House a lot. This is a person who's been around Washington and been around the halls of power a lot. It's much different than when a President Clinton first comes in or a President Obama first comes in, where you know it, the trappings of all this must be even harder to grow accustomed to. Oh, I, I agree with you so very much. Um, President, well, President Biden, when he was Vice President, was literally like um, maybe. 12 feet down from the Oval Office, his office, the, the vice presidential office. Um, and so he's been in the West Wing. He, he understands the functionings of the West Wing, of the White House. He knows how to turn those lights on day one. And that's what this country really needed. We need experienced hands. We need someone who can walk in, understand what needs to be done uh, and how to get it done expediently. Uh, President Biden will know exactly how to do that. And, um, and he will have a steady, a steady second uh, in, in Kamala Harris. But as I mentioned to you, Fred, um, he's brought in a slew of people who have been there and done this before uh, alongside him. They can speak a shorthand so that they can start to move on our domestic policy issues, um, start to make headway on those important foreign policy issues. Executive orders, as he has uh, committed to, will be written out and signed um, several just today. They will be signed today. Um, we will see this administration taking action uh, very, very quickly because they know how to do it. They know how the government runs. Uh, being president is going to feel comfortable for President Biden. And what are some of the things that are uh, taking place today? We're going to have uh, the U.S. back in the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. You're going to have an executive order to undo the uh, Trump executive order on the travel ban uh, yeah. for Muslim countries. Uh, you're going to have uh, a new immigration uh, approach taking place. Uh, what else do you expect in this sort of early, uh, this early period? You know, I, as I mentioned, there will be a mask mandate. Um, and, um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what else uh, he plans to tackle. I do understand that President Biden is most concerned about really focusing on the economy. He wants to... Um, to make sure that Americans have the resources again, that they have jobs again, that 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 the economy starts to chug along, uh, not only for the one percent but for everyone in this country, and so uh, he will remain steadfast on how to do that, working with private sector partners in doing that. Um, so he is looking at again that. Um, uh, sending out those surplus uh, checks, the stimulus checks rather, um, out to every American. And he would like to, as he had noted, making that uh, rounded up to 2000. So there will be a, a move towards uh, another $1,200 stimulus check that will be sent out to every American. Um, and I think it really is, everything you look at is, um, is about unity. In fact, the presidential inaugural committee said the theme of today was going to be, quote, reflects the beginning of a new national journey that restores the soul of America, bringing the country together and creating a, a path to a, a brighter future. It was interesting that, uh, that uh, then President-elect Biden, now President Biden, uh, went to church this morning. He's the second Catholic to be elected president. He went to church this morning. And if, if I'm not mistaken, he had uh, two uh, Republican uh, leaders uh, with him, um, uh, the now minority leader of the Senate before majority leader, uh, Secretary McConnell, and then uh, Congressman McCarthy, um, uh, one of the leaders of the House. And so he's already symbolically reaching out and people are reaching back. And Secretary McConnell yesterday saying that President Trump provoked um, the, uh, the violence on January 6th, which is a long way to go for Secretary McConnell. 
Yes, um, I, I I agree with you. You know, the 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 outreach of of President Biden, he understands the importance of those two leaders uh, being there uh, in a united front with Speaker Pelosi and and now Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer. Um, it's really important. Um, you know, I, I think about this, and I and it's a head scratcher, Fred. When when then. President Trump had just finished taking the oath of office and he went into uh, the luncheon that was hosted by Speaker Pelosi. Um, he sat down and, and it, well, he gave some remarks and he noted in his remarks how touched he was that President Clinton and Secretary Clinton attended the inauguration and were there seated at this luncheon someone he fought long and hard against, had a very contentious election with a much closer margin than this past election. And yet there she sat in front of him to honor this day for him. I just, it's a head scratcher to me that you don't offer that same reverence, that same honor and uh, to duty to office uh, to the person who is succeeding you. Um, so, so President Biden un does understand these important moments, and uh, instead of of only having a unified front within his party, he knows to bring in everyone. That this has that it, this country does not work unless we are united in our purpose. Yeah, I, 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 I that's certainly the message, and I think that's absolutely uh, uh, true. Um, the other thing. Um, uh, is that um, let's talk about what hasn't happened this week. And that is violence. Hmm. Certainly not in the nation's capital and not of the sort that one had feared, particularly seeing much of the traffic that one had picked up on certain social networks. Uh, you know, I was driving around uh, town yesterday and uh, it did feel a little bit like a war zone with concrete barriers, high fences, um, 25,000 National Guard troops. Now there are only 5,000 US service members currently stationed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the most National Guard troops, as I understand it, that have been in the district before was after the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968, and that was 13,000. Uh, so, uh, it, uh, you know, knock on wood, we have the rest of the day to go, but uh, so far it's good. People were also asking, uh, I, I, uh, President Biden and Vice President Harris are on their way to lay a wreath at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, as you noted. Uh, and you also talked about inauguration concert celebrating America. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot of people are picking up the central quotes uh, of, this, uh, of this day. Uh, the one about the uncivil war, we must end this uncivil war. This is a time of testing. Uh, politics does not have to be a raging fire. So, and again and again, this message of unity that you're talking about so much, Capricia, and it doesn't have to be a unity of agreeing on things. It has to be a unity of wanting to get things done. Yes, and that's what's so beautiful about the United States of America. We we have the liberties to say what we want to say. We have this these beautiful rights that have been given to us by our constitution, by our forefathers, that, you know, freedom of speech, it, it is there, for, you know, freedom of, of, of religion. We can, we can do so much more than many other countries can, people in other countries can around the world due to their government and due to the structure of. Um, and so we should embrace those. We should, um, we should make sure that we hold them dear because, uh, you know, uh, as, as you noted, our, our democracy is fragile and, and we, want to, we want to maintain those liberties. We want to um, live up to the values that our forefathers had set forth for us. Um, I'm looking at the visual right now and I don't know where they, they actually have us going, but it looks like it's back into uh, the Capitol. There looked as though there was some sort of business that was taking place between the leadership uh, love to find out at some point what exactly um, was taking place uh, between the speaker, majority leader, um, and, uh, and, and and the president um, and vice president. Yeah, I, I've got a message here that uh, the congressional leaders are presenting gifts to President Biden. Ah, 
Ah, and so okay. I, I guess this must be another one of the traditions we're talking about. Right. So we're going to wrap up in uh, three or four minutes. Um, uh, I, I want to tell people to stay on, come back at 1.30 Eastern time. We're going to have uh, former Swedish Prime Minister Carl Bildt, former Prime Minister of, of the former National Security Advisor to George W. Bush, Steve Hadley. Um, we're going to have Secretary Ernest Moniz, former Secretary of Energy to Obama. Uh, we're going to have Ana Palacio, former Foreign Minister of Spain, and then uh, Lord uh, George Robertson, uh, former Secretary General of NATO. All of these people are associated with the Atlantic Council as International Advisory Board members or board members, and they'll be discussing what they just heard, and they'll be giving their own views on, 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 on what they've seen and where it goes from here. Uh, Capricia, what are you going to be watching for in the first couple of months of this new administration? You've seen new administrations come in. You've seen some of them take false steps. Some of them take good steps. Uh, what, what ought we be? What, what ought we be looking for in the in the coming days? Well, uh, yes, it, it is interesting. Those first few days, everyone wants to get so much done. That's that sometimes perhaps we chew off a bit more than. Uh, then, then we can then we can get accomplished. Um, so I'm, I want to see a steady progression. I want to see that the uh, the vice the president <laughs> that's just wonderful to call him that um, continues on with the mission at hand, focusing on the economy, focusing on the pandemic, and that the entire White House and actually our entire government is linked arm in arm in that endeavor together. That we don't have a, a sort of a, a we, we, we can, as many people have said, we can chew gum and walk at the same time. I do understand that because there will be other issues that Congress in particular will need to attend to, but the administration itself, unified effort, moving those, those um, important um, endeavors along on how we bring some relief uh, back to Americans, how we as an American uh, country, uh, how our, our country comes back together and, and can see one another in person, uh, touch our grandparents, um, say hello to our neighbor again, um, go into the Atlantic Council and do the business that we want to do. I'm dying to see you, Fred. Um, and, uh, and really sort of enjoy those moments of camaraderie again. So I, that is what I'd like to see. And I, that's what I believe we will see. I, will, I do believe that President Biden and, and uh, Vice President Harris will uh, take the reins on those important issues and move them forward. Thank you, Capricia, for that. I, I, you know, I'll close. Uh, the Atlantic Council's mission is shaping the global future together with partners and allies. So that's three parts. I mean, shaping, you take action. Uh, President Biden spoke of being bold. There are many people in the Biden administration that didn't think the Obama administration was bold enough. And so you may see more bold from this administration, and I'll be watching for that. I think the $1.9 trillion package and an infrastructure package likely to follow that in February, uh, you could see some bold strokes. And let's see how much bipartisan support they get. Uh, you do have um, the Democrats uh, essentially controlling both houses, but 50-50 uh, in the Senate with a tie-breaking Kamala Harris voice. If history has taught us anything, it's if you overreach at moments like this, there can be blowback from midterm elections. And I think President Biden knows that. I'm also gonna be watching to see, the, one of the mistakes from administrations come in is they wanna wash away everything a previous administration did. Uh, you know, pox on all their houses. Uh, and I'm also gonna watch whether things like the Abraham Accords, which is such a great breakthrough mm -hmm. in the Middle East, can be built upon. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, it's very positive that President Biden, I keep wanting to say President-elect Biden, but it's President Biden. It's, it's wonderful to me that President Biden did embrace this agreement when the UAE and Bahrain reached it with, with Israel. It's now expanded beyond that, uh, uh, Sudan and Morocco and, and, and could go further than that. Um, you now see the healing of the rift between um, Qatar and, uh, and Saudi Arabia and UAE. So I, I think the, the, I, I'm going to be looking for these bipartisan moments where one can send the message, not only do we want to unify, but we also understand there's a lot of good uh, that did happen. There's some good that did happen in the previous administration that we can build upon. And there's other things we're going to change pretty dramatically as we see with these executive orders. Capricia, I'm going to pass to you for a final word. My final word 
is what a great day. You can make it even better by getting Capricia's book, Protocol. But, uh, but this is a historic day. Uh, uh, you know, the, the presidential historian Douglas Brinkley talked about it as a crisis inauguration, maybe not of the level that Franklin Roosevelt faced or Abraham Lincoln, but this is an inflection point in history. There is a rise of China. There is a question about the future of democracies. Uh, there is a question about whether the US is going to play its leadership role. So this is a much more important election than your everyday uh, election and not just because of uh, the divisions that we saw uh, at the Capitol on January 6th. Capricia, let me pass to you for closing words. Well, I just want to say thank you to you, Fred, uh, and your leadership at the Atlantic Council. Um, you have uh, set forth a, an extraordinary agenda during this time um, that we have all been sheltered in place. Um, you can continue to keep those connections out into the world. And um, you lead an amazing staff of individuals, dedicated staff. And I, I, there's one person that I just really wanted to do a bit of a shout out to, and that is uh, the spouse of Julia Varghese, Maju Varghese, who um, you should all know was someone who was instrumental in creating the sentiment, the emotion, the beauty that we all witnessed today at the inauguration. He took the lead on that. And so I, I just really wanted to give a nod to Maju. Um, I certainly hope- Julie, for those that you don't know, is our chief administrative officer. And, and so, uh, and, 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 and her husband is playing this crucial role around the inauguration and then going into the White House. Absolutely. And so to, to everyone at the Atlantic Council, so incredibly grateful to, to you for the work that you do, um, for the patience that you have with people like me on technology and particularly. Um, and I look forward uh, to the days ahead, Fred, to the challenges that we're all going to be facing and working to get to know this administration better, connecting with this administration and connecting this administration to the world. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Capricia, and thanks for all of you listening in. Come back in six minutes, and we're going to have this very rich discussion that will take more, a, a bigger swipe at some of the geopolitical issues and questions that uh, some of these great leaders from around the world are going to deal with. Uh, we'll see you soon.